You're listening to the Run For Your Lives podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Daphne. And I'm Pank. <laughs> and this is the Run For Your Lives podcast. Yes. I'm just trying to, to, to fit your uh, your energy going into that. I don't know. The, <laughs> the, uh, the, the inflection of the voice I was going for. <laughs> I don't know. Was I, I sounded mostly like I'm opening the evening news, I think. that Yeah, <laughs> that was different than usual. I don't usually yeah. do that. <laughs> and somehow I just changed it up for no reason yeah. whatsoever. And then I, I adapted on the fly. I'm good. And you adapted <laughs> too. Are you going to deliver the information about our episode the same way? Let's see. We we will see. Hey, you know, that's a great idea. So here we go, everyone. <laughs> this episode. I don't know. I, I have to get into like newscaster mode. All right. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't know what that's supposed to be. This episode. The supernatural horror film. Mama, directed and co-written by Andy Machete, released January 18th, 2013. I don't know. I feel like being newscasters is not our thing. So we're no. just going to not do that again, but we're leaving yeah. it in for this week because... Oh, of course. Why of the course. hell not? We have to. <laughs> it's got to be done. So I'm really happy to talk about this one with you because I know it's one that you really enjoy. I had only seen it once. Yeah, uh, it's been a while since I've seen it, but I've always kind of, when asked about my favorite horror movies, I've always included this one in my top five. And it's, I think, just the way it affected me the first time I saw it, being in theaters. And with horror movies in theaters, it's always better when you have people that are sitting in the row in front of you who are just terrified of everything that happens on the screen. And yes. that, that also affects, you know, because... <laughs> I see this movie and I can think back to the couple and be like, oh my God, you know, so it's great. Um, but <laughs> that's how you know that a horror movie is really effective. Yeah. If the people in front of you are freaking out and you're just sitting back there kind of laughing at them. Uh -huh. You know that it's effective. <laughs> yes. I've seen so many, I think it doesn't affect me as much. Yeah. But rewatching it now, um, I think I can still say it fits in that top five. Um. As far as without putting too much thought into it, it's still definitely something I really enjoy. Does it hold up as well this many years later? CGI wise, no, definitely not. There's it's got some rough moments, but I still think the story is great. I mean, it's it's Guillermo del Toro as a executive producer. So even though yes. he hasn't really directed or he didn't even have any of the writing really in it, this is all machete. Mm -mm. But but it still has that del Toro flavor where it's. It's scary, it's supernatural, there's definitely horror aspects, but it somehow finds a way to have like a charming bit of heart and like fantasy wonder to it at the same time. It does. I think especially because it is supernatural and you have a couple who are taking care of these two girls and all of these weird things start happening in their world and... Watching them go through the movie, I think for me, Annabelle's arc was the most interesting. Mm -hmm. However, there were also other little things here and there that were also pretty interesting. So I think we have a lot to talk about. Yeah. So let's get right into it. Of course, you always have some fun behind the scenes stuff to kick us off. Before we dive in. Just a few things this week. Just a few things. So this was filmed in Barcelona, Spain, and Hamilton, Toronto, and Montreal, Canada. The screenplay was written by Andy Muschietti and his sister Barbara, and is an expanded version of their 2008 Argentine short film of the same name. It was scheduled for an October 2012 release, but that was postponed until January 2013, because they didn't want it to compete with a little movie called Paranormal Activity 4. <laughs> Having seen all the Paranormal Activity movies, this one is incredibly better, like so much better than 
Paranormal Activity 4. So, I don't know. I guess the draw of that series of movies at the time was bigger, but I think Mama Stands on Its Own is a better film. Yeah. I think I only saw the first two Paranormal Activity movies. I don't think I watched anything past that. Not missing much. (laughs) Sometime I want to go back through and figure out what order you should be watching them in and see if it makes any more sense. Mm. But that is a project for a day way further down the road because I have a <laughs> lot of other things I'd rather do before then. So the budget for Mama was $15 million and it grossed $146.4 million, So it was a box office success. Yeah. It's 100 minutes long. So, not too long. Mm -hmm. Pick, bring it on. Synopsis time. All right. A very low-key, not very spoilery synopsis. So, if you haven't seen the movie, you're not getting spoiled even by this yet. But then why are you listening to this? Go watch the movie. Uh, (laughs) But it's uh, after a young couple take in their two nieces. They suspect that a supernatural spirit named Mama has latched onto their family. Ooh. Mm. Yes. And I I feel like there were other ways they might have gone with this, given what happened at the start of the movie with Jeffrey Desange, and he basically snaps. I mean, they mm-hmm. could have gone at this a little bit different and, and looked at it like his wife, who he killed, in addition to two of his business partners, that maybe it was his yeah. wife that was kind of latching on to the girls. But that's not where they went with this. And I think that's one thing that stood out to me is it wasn't as conventional as I thought it was going to be. And I think the ending reminded me a lot of like a a Guillermo del Toro ending. However, it wasn't all tied up with unicorns and rainbows at the end. Like there was some loss there. And I think that was more effective. I -hmm. think it wouldn't have been... As good a movie had ended with, and everybody's safe at the end, all happy together. I just think it it just was more impactful the way that it ended. That's my thought on it anyway. Yeah. Awesome. I have a thought that I can't really bring up to you because I don't want to spoil anything about a different movie, but you'll like that if we get to it at some point because of what you just said. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That's... That means nothing to anybody, but I had to, I was like, okay, cool. Good to know. Good to know. Um, (laughs) Is this a movie I haven't seen that you're going to suggest we cover sometime? uh, Sort of. Okay. It's already been suggested. I think it's already on the slate. Um, (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Excellent. I'm ready. Sounds fun. Yeah. um, Anyway. Where were we? Oh, yes. Uh, just kind of the ideas of what directions they could have taken. I did like uh, that they hinted at another direction it could have taken. It ended up not taking. But it could have also been another interesting way to do it is we have that moment where Dr. Dreyfus is considering that it's a split personality thing and that Mama is actually a figment of Victoria and that she's kind of creating it or is embodying it. Which ends yes. up not being true. But that also could have been an interesting idea as well to play with. Absolutely. That would have been a cool twist. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we got. We got something that was a bit more supernatural and terrifying. Because there were Mm -hmm. moments that I was grateful that I wasn't in this movie. (laughs) It was just, yeah, yeah, it was just really creepy. Uh, It's even though I've seen it several times and I know exactly what's going on. And it's still creeps me out there's still moments where i'm just like like wiggling just like "Mm, nope mm, mm, not (laughs) not happy with this i i think i threw a note in here i just said this movie really jeebies my heebies uh (laughs) 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 there's just a couple of things and i'm like oh i don't like it but i do love it i like it but uh yeah very uh uncomfortable in some places which i like (laughs) <laughs> I like that it does that to me. I think that but makes yeah. it stand out more. I think when they are able to tell the story and make you uncomfortable, there are points that are just much more memorable because of that. Yeah. Overall. So with that, I guess we might as well get into our usual 
coverage of the movie, going kind of character to character. We could jump around on all kinds of different ideas, but yeah, we can uh, <laughs> make sure to get through everything. And who better to start with than Jessica Chastain's Annabelle? She does kind of take on the pivotal like star role of this movie for sure, I think. She does. And I wasn't sure it was going to go there at first because it really seemed like it was going to be Nikolai Koster Waldell that was going to go down mm-hmm. that road because he was playing twins. And I thought, oh, wow, I wonder what we're going to get with this. But we got a lot more of her because yeah. she was thrust into the role as being the surrogate mother for mm-hmm. these two girls after they are rescued, recovered from a cabin in the woods after five years of being on their own. And so she gave up. I mean, she sacrificed her music career to be with her partner. Did they ever say if they were married? They didn't. So that's what, because that synopsis that I pulled, um, I don't remember exactly where it came from. It came from IMDb. I don't remember if it was the official synopsis from the, like, production company or if it was like just kind of critic written so i'm not sure because they don't they didn't really specify because we do have annabelle's friend telling her you should leave him and she doesn't because she loves him. i mean she obviously loves him and she wants to stay with him and she knows how important these girls are he's lost his brother in a tragic way if i mean so annabelle is thrust into this world of taking care of these two girls and then at one point not too far after they've taken custody of the girls basically mama takes Mm -hmm. it out on lucas and he ends up in a coma and so she's really thrust into it where she's taking care of the girls and that's kind of when she starts bonding with victoria because there's Mm -hmm. a difference between those two girls victoria when she goes to the cabin. She was a little bit older. She had vocabulary. She was smart. But yeah. Lily was just a baby at the time. And you can tell the difference because Lily grew up in a world with very little vocab, you know, very little talking. Mm-hmm. And Victoria was more, you know, still feral, but she at least was walking on two legs when they. Yeah were at the shelter. Lily was not. She was very yeah. feral. It's it's a lot to take in for for Annabelle and that's why I really like her so much. She definitely has the most like the best arc because yeah, yeah, you mentioned she's I mean, she's this punk rock chick who's got an artist boyfriend who's pretty cool and it's like we're just living the good life. Just, you know, <laughs> love you am, right? Like just do yeah. what you want to do and then and then all of a sudden, yeah, it's like she's not she has no desire to be a mom there's she's not prepared for parenting and all of a sudden oh yeah here's these two young girls who have god knows how much kind of buckets of trauma that they're carrying with them and here you go they're yours and then well okay well at least maybe i can you know have have my partner their uncle you know to lean on through oh no it's just me now awesome wonderful incredible um but it pushes her You know, she has those moments where she's like, I don't want to do this. I never asked for this. But then she turns around and protects them and reaches out to them and has some incredibly touching and awesome moments where you can see she's capable and she does have that instinct. And I think she really does fall in love with these girls. And so you get to see some really cool stuff with that. I mean, she's overall, she's good people. Um, Yeah, the way I would put it, you know, when I talk about... Where, you know, I mean, she does. She immediately, while talking with her bandmate, the singer in her band, because she's like, well, you could leave him because you didn't ask for this. And she's like, yeah, I could, but um, I'm not going to. And in fact, I'm actually going to leave you guys uh, because this is more important for him. And the fact that she is easily able to make that decision shows that she does care. Yeah. She wanted to be in his life. They they were tight. Um, They had a solid relationship. This was just a situation that she had to embrace in order to support him. And she easily did it because, I mean, like I said, they were solid. And I think we see the biggest testament to her arc at the very end of the movie. Oh, yeah. When 
Mama is taking the girls to the cliff. And she continues, no matter what Mama does, to crawl toward Victoria and hold Mm -hmm. on to her in any way that she can. Yeah, she's just fighting and pushing through that. And that's what keeps Victoria there at the end. Yes. And it's it's that moment, it's that visual of Victoria stopping and realizing that Annabelle has a hold of that strap on her robe, which is a callback visual too when Annabelle finds Victoria just sitting in the bathroom on the floor by the tub crying. And it's because Victoria is bothered because she's starting to kind of build this connection with Annabelle and mm-hmm. she doesn't want Mama to hurt Anna because of this. Yes, exactly. And so she kind of has that moment. It's like, she, you know, Annabelle's not even allowed to touch her lovingly mm-hmm. because of that fear where she's like, don't, you know, you can't do this because she'll get jealous. And mm-hmm. as Victoria's going to rush out of the bathroom and she grabs that strap, she's like, it's not aggressive, but it's like, no, hang on. And so it's in that moment and on the moment in the cliff. It, it's it's kind of the same practical Anna's actions saying, I am invested. Be here with me. Let me help you. Mm-hmm. I love you. Yeah. And, don't go. Stay yeah. with me. And we see that. And Victoria decides to stay. I wonder had she had a little more time with Lily, if that might have materialized on that end. But she didn't. Mm-hmm. And you could see there was some bonding going on with Lily. When Lily went yeah. outside and slept under the tree, and then uh, Annabelle goes and gets her, brings her in, and is blowing on her hands to warm them up, and is just mm-hmm. being affectionate I... but motherly. It started to happen, the breakthrough. It was there. Yeah, I, I get teary every time with that scene. That is the one that, like, even like while writing out my notes on it, I almost wanted to start crying like that one touches me a lot it's it's easily my favorite scene in the whole movie it's it's very touching to me because yeah we get lily who has slept all night outside in the cold because mama took her outside and then left to go deal with dr dreyfus back at the cabin yes oh my god practically it's where you see this this split that mama i mean the ending then kind of brings it up to where they kind of have this you know, bonding and happiness or whatever, moving into the afterlife together to where mama was there with her. But in that moment, mama abandoned her mm-hmm. and didn't come back for her. Exactly. And she stays out there. And then when Annabelle sees her, she runs out there, gathers her up, takes her inside, trying to warm her up. And she's just like fighting it and screaming and pushing and she's restraining her and holding mm-hmm. her down. And it's, the restraint I really appreciated, by the way. Uh, yes. Great technique. It was a great technique yeah. um, because I do, I, I I do and have done work with kids with aggressive tendencies and social kind of issues and stuff. So um, I've actually had to learn the correct way to safely and calmly restrain a child while taking into account and priority the safety of the child, yourself, and others. And you know, doing and she nailed it. <laughs> I was like, while watching that, yeah, I was like, yeah she, she did she's a great job personally. I've never had to implement it, so but I know what to do. Um, and so, like seeing it, I was mm-hmm. like, okay, cool. It's a good, uh, good lesson right there for for people in that. Because um, Lily is freaking out, and she's just holding on, and it's that it's it's a safety restraint where she's not being aggressive, she's not holding her down. It's calm, it's comforting, right? It's, it's creating a and, safe space. Yeah, and then when she's breathing on her hands and stuff, like you said, and warming her up, and then that's when something switches in Lily where she realizes like this is a true loving caring person a parenting soul a parenting spirit no pun intended because the other is a spirit as well but (laughs) yeah but you know um you know mama's never this warm literally or figuratively no definitely not and so that's why this moment touches me so much is because there's no like intimacy or gentle touch or whatever with Mama, the spirit. And so this is what a mama, a mother should feel like mother. and be like. And I think Lily starts to recognize that. Unfortunately, yeah. it's too little, too late. And yeah, it, it's disappointing. But for this moment, but for this moment, yeah. it is, it's it so incredibly special. warming. 
And I, I, so it is definitely my favorite moment in the whole movie. And then of course it ends kind of on a sour note, just with a little thing. Cause you have Victoria walks in and sees it. And it's kind of the split thing because she's like, Oh, it's, it's good that Annabelle is, is, you know, connecting with Lily and this family unit's here, but you can also tell Victoria's worried because she's looking. that just means Annabelle's encroaching yeah. on, on mama's territory just that much more. And it's going to end you know, not in a good way if this keeps happening. Yeah. Yeah. Victoria, she had a look of concern. She would look around at different things. There was, there were several points when she was being interviewed that she would be looking before she answered. And she was looking at mama before she gave mm-hmm. any responses because she needed her approval before she said anything. And that was more and more apparent. Now, when Lily went outside, it's because she, Mama wanted to go outside and play. Well, Victoria, Lily went over to Victoria and tried to get her to come out and play too. But Victoria, that was the first time that Victoria said, Victoria, stay. Mm -hmm. Which meant that she wasn't going to go out and play anywhere she was going to stay in bed and that's where she was and that's what victoria being older and kind of her arc really is realizing what an actual family unit supposed to be Mm -hmm. and her struggling with the mama situation where she pretty quickly like comes to realize like this isn't healthy this isn't good this isn't right no no but mama kept them alive and here's the thing you have to give her that much credit. She did yeah. keep her and Victoria and Lily alive because originally their dad was going to kill them and then kill himself. And as mm-hmm. soon he, as he started with the gun, Mama took him out so yeah, he couldn't hurt was, them. Yeah, just t- took care of that pretty quick, which I like that, you know, uh, luckily Victoria didn't really see so much what happened it was all blurry because you know he had taken her glasses off before that but but yeah that guy (laughs) jamie lannister was just terrible as a father and (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh which i say i mean lucas is the same actor it's nicola because of all that in the same but you know it's it's funny um they couldn't be more different like they could not be more different jamie lannister was a horrible father but then jamie lannister was a great father figure so um (laughs) so funny but i think he was he must have filmed these around the same time probably I because think. he's not in this movie yeah that much so it was kind of a yeah. small role with a big maybe they had more for him originally and then due to maybe filming or kind of constraints with game of thrones that's why they would just like put him in a coma for most of the movie instead maybe that's the yeah. reasoning i don't know i haven't done the research to look it into makes that it but. easier but it's an assumption <laughs> Me either, I but looking at the time frames yeah. yeah it definitely makes sense that why he was in a coma and not as involved in the film as far as his participation in scenes because he just you know was probably called to do the other i yeah. mean who wouldn't want to be in game of thrones come on right who, but they didn't know. The funny thing is, we're talking about it now. No one knew at that time that Game of Thrones was going to blow up and be what it is. Yeah, because this would have been filmed, I mean, right around the same time as seasons one and two. Kind yeah. of that same. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No one knew. I mean, when I saw this, I had never seen Game of Thrones. And it came out a little bit after yeah. Game of Thrones had started. Because I caught up. I think they had done were. Going into season four, when I decided to watch the first three yeah, seasons. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same way, except I binged the first four seasons and then started five when it was airing. So I got yeah. into Game it's of Thrones hard, a little late. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> when you binge, you get to binge all those episodes and then you have to go week to week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it makes me mad because I, I don't want to go week to week. Yeah. But I'm learning to go week to week with some series because some of my favorite podcasts Do that with shows. And the show will be completely out and available on a platform, but the podcast goes week to week. So Mm. I have to take my time and wait. And it's very hard. It's a good lesson in patience. (laughs) 
Yes. Uh. And I am very impatient. So <laughs> it's something I need to work on. So podcasts are helping with that. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so back to Annabelle with stuff with her dealing with, with mama. And I love how it's kind of in classic horror movie fashion where it starts very small and then things build, you know, it's very, you know, just the lights flickering yeah. and then Lily just like appearing and freaking her out. And it's, you know, or just like a quick glimpse of mama in the mirror while her and Lucas are about to have some uh, intimate times. And then she's like yes. free and it, it freaks her out there. Uh, and so she just kind of, it's like those little things that, that build. And, but she sticks with these kids throughout the whole thing. I have a little funny note about Annabelle's tuck in technique is great. Just pat, 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 lightly hit him on the head. Good night. <laughs> stellar, <laughs> stellar, stellar tuck in technique. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm sure it improved over time. <laughs> Probably. Uh, but, you know, the, her thing, she's talking to Dr. Dreyfus, like, I think someone's coming to visit them. I was like, well, you seem way less bothered by that than you should be, um, than what I'd expect. But then she thinks it's Aunt Jean because that lady. Uh. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, you can understand where she was coming from. Definitely. With, with Jean, I, mean, I was like, she's, can. she's obnoxious as hell. But at the same time, I think, well, maybe she really does want the best for the kids. I mean, her yeah. niece was, she is like the great aunt or second aunt. She's or the great aunt. Some, yeah. Because her niece was married to Jeffrey Dessange. And yes. So her niece was killed by their father. And so she still is like this, like kind of loose familiar. I mean, she's family, but loosely in a way that she yeah. hasn't really been around for them. But now this is what she wants. And, you know, maybe she really does want to be in their lives and want the best for them. But the way she goes about it is she's constantly kind of judging or putting down Lucas and Annabelle and has no faith in them and just yes. wants, wants them to have nothing to do with it. And then she's like looking for excuses. She's showing up on her meeting and trying to find signs of abuse and, Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. I mean, the bruises I get being worried about, but I mean, <laughs> Annabelle has a point like Lily really does literally just spend her time literally crawling and skittering around like an animal. So of course she's going to be a little bruised up. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. It reminded me honestly of the little vampire kids in the strain, the mm -hmm. way that she would crawl around. Cause it's uh -huh. just this very creepy way. And she was always climbing in and out of boxes. Yeah. Like just, just like a cat. I don't know. I guess it was. Yes. <laughs> a creepy cat. I feel like it's a cross between the vampire kids from the strain and Samara from The Ring. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Creepy. Good, yeah. Super creepy. But uh, she starts seeing more Mama through dreams, which this doesn't really ever explain why Mama tends to have this effect on people where kind of their dreams are affected by her memories and her things. Yeah. Because um, it happened to Victoria, and now Annabelle is seeing the same dreams that Victoria was mentioning in her sessions. With this woman taking the baby from the nuns and then jumping over the cliff to escape pursuers. And it's kind of this, you know, murder, suicide, cliff jumping, me and my baby die together. Which then we find out is, you know, through Dreyfus's research and then Annabelle looking through that, is kind of Mama's whole deal. Her unfinished business, so to speak, as a spirit, as a ghost. If you want to go into that, you know, stereotype of it is that when she attempted this back in the 1800s or whatever with her child, they didn't die together. Something went wrong. No. The baby ended up getting hung up on the limb and she fell to her death. And then the baby, unfortunately, this might be triggering for some people. So sorry. Uh, but, you know, like, I mean, probably just starved to death hanging from that branch. Like mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was a, very sad. So, yeah. It was that situation. Yeah. The woman's name was Edith Brennan. Mm-hmm. They refer to her as Helvetia a lot, too. And that yeah. was the name that was on the house, which I did look that up. And it's it's the female personification name for the country of Switzerland. And it's the original name for Switzerland before it was Switzerland. I don't know what kind of importance that has at all. I don't know. But <laughs> I found it interesting that Louise, who was helping um, Dr. Dreyfus... She takes him down this aisle 17, which is the lost and found of things people don't want to find. Mm -hmm. 
which I thought was a really interesting way of describing. This is kind of where all the remains of people, children are. And then she had this one quote where she, this is what she said. When a corpse is left out, the elements wither it, desiccate it, twisting twisting it into a distorted figure that's barely recognizable as a human being. A ghost is an emotion bent out of shape, condemned to repeat itself time and time again until it writes the wrong that was done. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was really a great explanation of exactly what mama is doing. Yeah. Like she was looking for her baby as a ghost and then she happened upon these two little girls that were in this house mm-hmm. or cabin in the woods with their father. And she kind of, you know, put, adopted them yeah, to take care of them. Mm-hmm. Which is fine and dandy for what it was at the beginning. But then it, Mama, and that's again with this ending. The ending is very hard to parse as far as is it a good it's not a happy ending by any means but like no it's not a happy ending it it does have Mm -hmm. this strange sense of hope to it but it's not it's still really dark because what it is is kind of the whatever had put this lady into an asylum back whenever she escaped to get this baby is this desire so yeah, she wanted to like take care of of the child and then be- the children in this instance when she finds them. But there's this possessiveness to it where she's very much yeah. haunted or like possessed by this idea of if I can't have them, nobody can. Yeah. And that was her thing was so when she didn't die with her child, these girls have now she took them in and was protecting them, but now that Lucas and Annabelle have them, it becomes this cycle again where she's like, well, then I guess I'm going to have to re- re- you know, right my wrong of not dying with my other child. And now I'm going to have to take them down with me and die with them and complete this cycle. Yeah. At first, she seemed OK because when Annabelle brought her the remains of her baby, because it was actually her baby that was taken away from her and given to the yeah. nuns. She seemed OK. With this, and she started to look even human. You see this transformation in her. Mm -hmm. But then Lily says, Mama, and that completely shifts her from this peaceful, you know, entity to one of rage almost. That. Yeah. Where she decides then that the remains of this baby, that's not enough because now she has Lily. And Lily's willing to yeah. to go with her. And so that's more yeah. important. And yeah, so she's going to fight for, for Lily right there at the end. And that's where I'm going to note about Lucas. I said, because Mama incapacitates him for a while. I was like, just as he made his way back into the plot of this movie. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you would have thought, I mean, you could tell based on the early parts of the movie that, that we saw, he was... He gets to the house at the beginning and he wants to know where the girls are. Like, he's really concerned about his nieces and he's invested all his money. Like, he doesn't have any money left. He's paying out of pocket for five years. Keep to searching keep for searching the girls. For them, or at least to find yeah. out what happened. And he's invested mm-hmm. in this. And I get the impression from Annabelle is she's gone along with it. But I'm not sure how invested she is. In the pro in the project because, you know, she just she makes a few comments that I just started to think. Well, you know, she's humoring him, but I didn't know if she was really what she really thought about it. But then, as time goes on, she becomes more and more invested because she meets the girls and she spends time with them, and she's kind to them. And she knows that they're going through a lot. And I think that was apparent when Jean came to the house and was talking about the bruises and all the different things. And Annabelle wasn't as concerned. And I think it's because Annabelle knows that the girls have been through living on their own in really terrible conditions. And she's not concerned about a few bruises here and there. She's just trying to help them adapt 
the best way that she can, and she knows it's going to take time. She's very mm-hmm. calm about it, where Jean's kind of just getting all uppity right away. Like, well, you know, they, I, I got the impression that she thought they should be, you know, well behaved and in a certain way. And that's just not what you do when a kid goes through trauma. You can't just have this expectation that a magic wand can be waved. Yeah. Because it doesn't happen that way. Exactly. It takes time and a lot of effort from caring people <laughs> to help process through something. Mm-hmm. Kids are resilient, but it's not an overnight project. It's something that takes time. No. And and especially when they've been through levels of trauma and stuff is something, again, I've learned through what I do and one of the things that I work with is, you know, especially when trauma is involved, kids don't owe no. you good behavior. As much as you think they, they, they should, they don't. Um, they don't. <laughs> it's for you. It's it's not for you to to hoard. You know, they're not. Uh, that's not the right word. But uh, to hang over them and and pound. No good behavior, and this is how we yeah. affect things. And you know, this is how we react to things into them. It's about finding where yes. they're at, and then processing and working through things with them, not telling them what to do, but have, helping them come through it yeah. themselves and and you know you, you you can't fix somebody else you have to work you can but you can hold their hand as they try to fix yeah. themselves you can be there for them but you can't force change no you can't force and kids things. yeah kids so, need you yeah. to come to their level you need to figure out not why they're giving you a hard time but why are they having a hard time like what's affecting them so that you can help them come to some solutions on their own and they can move forward. It's not something mm-hmm. that you can just wave a wand or tell them what to do. It doesn't work that way. And I feel like exactly in that scene, we saw the two approaches. We got to see the differences in the mannerisms between the two of them. And at that point, I was just really grateful that the girls were with Lucas and Annabelle because she seemed to understand mm-hmm. that this was going to be something that would take a lot of effort, but in time could be okay. And Jean just wanted to snap her fingers and have it all be perfect. And that's not how, it's not how it works. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I don't know if I have a whole lot of other notes on Annabelle. I know even though, you know, we always do that kind of thing where we're like, okay, we'll talk about this character, but <laughs> yeah. then we're also going to go over a lot of our notes for other characters at the yeah. same time. Because, I mean, that's how, because these these kind of, you know, movies, not even just these kind, but movies in general and stories, it's all interwoven. That's the best kind of story. And so everybody's arcs are interlocked. And so, yeah, yeah we, we bounce around yes. a lot and that's okay. Different movie, <laughs> you know, we've talked about this before. That movies are just different. And some movies, it's really easy to talk about the one main arc. But in this one, there were a few different things. Because I think, you know, Victoria herself made some. The poor thing. I mean, if you think about it, where she started going off with her dad and trying to tell him he's driving too fast. To where she was at the end where she stands up to Mama and says, no, I want to stay with Annabelle. That was a little girl that went through trauma and little by little started to trust someone else. And it, you could see that she, Mm -hmm. it was going to be hard for her to be separated from her sister, but she knew that staying with Annabelle and Lucas was the right thing for her to do. And I think that shows some growth in her as well. She, the one thing that she kept saying that Victoria kept saying that kind of, um, stuck with me is when she was talking about the story of Edith, only she didn't, I don't think she knew her name was Edith. Um, but she talked yeah. about she escaped the hospital for sad people. And I just thought that was a really interesting yeah. way of explaining. Like that might be a way that you would explain to a child about a, a yeah. mental health facility. It's a hospital for sad people. So I thought that that was definitely interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see, because Lucas would be kind of next on the list of characters. If you don't have anything else about Annabelle and stuff as well. But I think I've kind of covered 
most all of my notes about him other than just have a fun note of his he found mama's moth hole which sounds a lot dirtier than it really is uh <laughs> oh, but no. still not a good oh, thing um, the moths. <laughs> oh my gosh oh the moths and then yeah and our hands coming out of that hole and pushing him over the banister and down the stairs which luckily he didn't die but did put him into a coma for a little while and Maybe one of the worst parts about that whole thing is that it forces Annabelle and the girls to have to go to the hospital and suffer through vents oh, and slap Oh, man. Chop. So. <laughs> that was. Yeah. It, the thing is, there are infomercials like that that exist. I don't think that. Is that a real thing? Oh, that is a real thing. Yeah, that's that is slap chop. Yeah. I have never even heard of a slap chop, but that yeah. was terrible. I thought it was something that oh, got God. made up for the movie, but you're telling me it's real? Vince is a real person with slap chop, and I think because he was also the ShamWow oh. guy. Um, I'm surprised you've never seen the slap chop because he's you could chop all kinds of different foods, no. soft and hard. Because there was a whole thing where he was like chopping nuts for a pie or something. There's like a whole line that became. A oh music. my You're gonna goodness! Love my nuts. You know? No, I remember something like that, and no, I've never seen. <laughs> I've never even heard of it. Oh man! <laughs> maybe it's because I don't cook. That, that is surprising. Much. So maybe I just block it out. If it's some sort of a food processing anything, I'm just kind of like, nope, not going there. So I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are, I don't have any yeah. notes. Vince Slomey. But then I think he changed his name to Vince Offer because he does all these uh, oh commercials. Oh, goodness. Infomercials. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. But yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> back to... Uh, Lucas, as as Vince is selling his slap chop to to Lily on the TV, uh, Lucas in this coma. But no, we get, you know, he wakes up and has this creepy dream vision thing. And again, it's that connection because Mama was there; she had set up a portal yeah. into his hospital room, and it affected him, and then kind of awakened him. He was having this, you know, <laughs> seizure, but then he woke up after it. But he's having this like vision of his brother telling him to go to the cabin to save the girls. And it's not really explained, you know, because the last we saw of his brother was he was just killed by Mama because he was going to kill himself and the girls anyway. But, yeah, I wonder, you know, he's even after he's in the hospital, he's still yeah. being targeted by Mama, that she would actually take the time to set up a portal there. And I wonder, is it, it because be. he looks like his brother? It and is she be. making that connection? Or it could also just be this protective and possessive instinct that she has over yeah. the girls in general. That, it, you know, she's got to watch Annabelle at the house, so maybe she's still got to keep an eye on Lucas at the hospital. So I wasn't really sure. They don't really delve into that. Yeah. But I was like, it's either just in general or maybe an extra interest because he looks like yeah. the person who tried to kill it, them before. That's interesting. And they had to have been like, well, obviously, they're identical twins. Victoria thought it was her father, like when she first saw him. She called him daddy and he mm -hmm. was trying to explain to her now that he was her father's brother. But I, you know, I think maybe she did set it up so that she could watch, maybe keep connected to him to see what he was doing. That's interesting. I'm not sure. Potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I set up yeah. that question. I don't have an answer yeah. for you, but it's something yeah. to think about. That's an intro. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Yeah. Maybe one of our listeners knows. The the other Nikolai Coster Waldell side yeah. of that, I think we've covered all of Jeff's yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, fuck, that, fuck that guy. But uh <laughs> yeah, do you have any more on, on No, I have we've talked about everything that I had. So many of my notes were about right. Annabelle and Mama that I didn't mm -hmm. have a ton on some of the other characters. Yeah, for sure. I'm trying to think you know, because just going in order of, you know, what I've got on my notes uh, with Victoria, see if I had any more. It's really more her and Lily together, just from a visual and horror aspect. When the start, the, like those people that Lucas has sent out searching for them first find them, the whole super feral, super creepy, like crawling around on the fridge. And oh, my goodness. Was just there's no horror quite like creepy kids. There really isn't. No, um, there isn't. Luckily, the kids creepiness doesn't last too long in the movie they kind of get you know fostered up and cleaned up and eased back into society for the most part uh but what comes with them is the creepiness from that point but but yeah uh you know th we talked about the differences that victoria's you know she remembers her dog and she easily is able to readapt pretty quickly but lily 
again, was just a baby. So really the only life she knows is the one with mama. So she doesn't adapt so well, uh, which the little girl that played Lily was just phenomenal at mm-hmm. creepy creepiness. But also there was just something I think my favorite thing with her is just when mama would appear, you know, you never saw mama a lot of the times, but just her face, yeah. that like cute little happy smirk that would show up and you're like, yeah, at first you're like, that's the most <laughs> adorable face I've ever seen in my life. But what it means terrifies me to my core. Um. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, it's like a child being happy to see the boogeyman. Right. Like, that's not something that you <laughs> see. You definitely don't see that. I, I was the moths. She was eating the moths at the hospital. Right. Ugh. She so was, she was great at creepy. I <laughs> yeah. The little girl that played her did not speak much English, so that's why she did very little. Her dialogue was mostly like this body response or one word face acting responses because yeah, face and acting, for a like body acting five or six year old, whatever she was at this time, like doing this, yeah, that was incredible. Um, <laughs> I it was give props to that. So cool, but yeah. Um, again with Victoria, I think just her connections with Annabelle are are great we talked about the scene where you know the first time that the annabelle grabs the strap on her robe and like that interaction that they had and you know victoria choosing to stay behind when when lily goes out to play with mama is she kind of doesn't want this connection with mama anymore it it's bothering her she's realizing this is Mm -hmm. not right and she wants to adapt, but there also comes with that worry that the more that she lets go of Mama, then the more jealous Mama is going to get. And it spells bad for the people that yes. she's trying to love. And it puts her in a really, you know, sticky situation there. Uh, she makes breakfast, well, there which was... is crispy burnt spaghetti. Yum. Uh- <laughs> yeah, that was... I wasn't sure what she was trying to make. Part of it looked like dirt and wor- like worms. Like I was not <laughs> sure what she was trying to make with that. I'm just not sure that Annabelle intended for her to make breakfast like that. I, yeah, it wasn't really. Yeah. Didn't look edible or appetizing. No. Um, there was one point too when Mama was after Annabelle. And Victoria screams at her and said, says, no, you promised. Yeah. So they must have made a deal with her. And she must have agreed not to hurt Isabel. I mean, Isabel, Annabelle. She must have agreed not to hurt Annabelle. However, she was kind of hurting her. Yeah, there was that was that was the (laughs) infection, so to speak, in Mama, that possessiveness. That was her downfall. Mm-hmm. That was the evil that was with this character. And what set it off that time before when she really, it goes into this jealous rage and attacks Annabelle and when Victoria has to yell at that, her is what sets that off is because, and you see it in Lily's eyes, like, Oh, you just fucked up is before going to bed. Victoria walks in and gives Annabelle a big hug and tells her, I love you. Mama's watching. Yeah. Mama's not happy. Um, Mama is always watching. Mm hmm. Yeah, and she's never happy. But you still, I still go back to the story, the story of Edith and everything that happened to her. And I have to sympathize with that. Like what she went through had to have been terrible. So I have to, you're looking at an entity. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't know the backstory. I mean, what did she do that had her baby taken from her and her locked into asylum? Had she tried to harm it before? There's all of these things that. You know, there we're are only given so much. There questions. Yeah. Yeah. There were some unanswered questions that make it difficult to understand. But part of me sympathizes with her. Like, you know, why Why did it happen to her? I mean, that was a time where a lot of terrible things happened to people. Mm-hmm. You know, they were putting people in mental institutions and asylums. Yeah, I mean, back in those days, her... Silly things. Psycho, you know, uh, crazy diagnosis could have just been the fact that she wanted to have a kid without a husband that she you know out of wedlock and you want to raise this child how dare you you know yes it could have been a number of things so yeah so i give her the benefit of the doubt you know so i i guess i can kind of 
empathize with her and what she was going through. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And then we talked about. She did take out Dr. Dreyfus, which I'm okay with. Because <laughs> from know. the beginning, he bothered me. I think he was just in invested. I think he just wanted to have answers. Yeah, but making a deal with the family, like, so he could continue to study the kids, seems a little icky to me. Like, oh, I'll help you. That I didn't like, like, right from the beginning. That It's a unique was... situation. It gives him a chance yeah. to, I mean, imagine the, uh, <laughs> you know, article and paper and things he could write and accolades he could get published of... Two young girls found living feral for five years and then re in, you know, readapting into society. And I mean, he had a very philosophical, educational, academic mind about it, I think. So I don't really read yeah. into it as anything like problematic or weird. I just think as an academic, this was something that he was very interested in and knew it could be something very important to study. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I think with about the girls, if there was anything, we talked about the ending a little bit. The music was very fantasy. Yeah. That's where I talk about the fantasy. It's very fantastic yeah. and very just like yeah. Disney in a way, you know, and it was, mm -hmm. had this kind of weird feeling because it's a very sad ending for our view, you know, but I guess to Lily and to Mama, it's this magical transition to the afterlife. And it was, it's a very unique take, very unique ending. Yeah. I would agree. The music was very, to me, Guillermo del Toro. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it had that vibe. The film definitely had a, an aesthetic and composition that is similar to what he would do in a movie. And I like that Machete wrote it. I mean, this is based on something he wrote. Yeah. So I definitely, after watching this movie again and starting, you know, taking notes, I really want to go and dig into his 2000, I think it's 2008 short film mm -hmm. and see if I can find it. Cause I want to watch it and see what, <laughs> what, you know, how different yeah. it is. I mean, it obviously didn't have a $15 million budget, but it had right. to have been clever. Cause he seems like a clever person to come up with this story. Yeah. I feel like there's definitely I, I like him as a writer and director. I don't know a whole lot of stuff he's done. I mean, he did both of the It remake films. and He did. He did. I love and his I, direction yeah. with those. So I do like yeah. what he does. I was trying to think what else he's done that I will have to IMDb on that. Oh, definitely. Because I feel like I've seen other... No, that's really... That's really all he's done. Oh, no, that's what it is. He's an executive producer on Lock and Key that we're covering on Strange Indeed right now. That's oh, why. Oh, my goodness. That's what, because I think that's how they got Jackson Robert Scott in that because he was in the It movies as well, the kid that plays Bodie. And so mm -hmm. I think that's that connection with that is, is Andy Machete is an executive producer. He works with Lock and Key. I knew there was something else that he was working on connection. that I enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Um, Dreyfus. I trying to see if I had any other notes about him. So just him just doing all of that digging. And he's there to get all this research and find this stuff that helps Annabelle put these connections together and realize what they have to do at the end. Um, and, of course, his <laughs> meeting his demise. You know, uh, him and Mama have a little, let's call it a meeting. And um, yes, why she was so... Meeting aggressive towards him i feel like i just have to put towards i mean she was watching every time that he was uh, interviewing and, and asking questions of victoria and i just I, she didn't like him digging and finding out what was mm -hmm. going on and bringing those things up to the surface because i mean it could turn victoria against mama or it could just give him good reason to take the kids I mean, I don't know if he could really take them away anywhere. She can follow them anywhere they go, I'm sure, but. Well, it's... I think even if he got to the bottom of what was going on and learned more about Mama and how to, like, maybe stop her. I think she didn't want to be stopped, 
even though if they figured out like with the bones of her child, like the remains, I don't know that she wanted to let go of the girls. I mean, it's obvious by the end, she didn't want to let go of the girls. Mm -hmm. I think her mission was to find her child, but I feel like on the way she adopted these kids. And I think she viewed him as someone that was going to try to keep the kids away, you know, find a way to get the kids against her or away from her. And she wanted to take him out. I mean, that was her, that was her whole focus of those girls. Like she adopted them and took care of them, kept them alive with cherries it seems like. Yeah, just with the cherries. <laughs> I was like, it was like, and like that, the murderous spirit that inhabits the house is already a way better parent than Jeffrey was. Um. <laughs> yes. Uh. Yeah, the minute he the, that mama dragged him off was like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you for taking care of the girls because he wasn't going to. He was a terrible man who made terrible choices and I'm glad that the kids were able to have some life, even though Lily went off to be with Mama. Yeah. There are just different ways they could have gone with this movie that they didn't go in, but I like what they did with it. Yeah. Because it wasn't that conventional happy ending that you get. But Guillermo del Toro has that in his movies. It's not always tied up in a little bow. Yeah. Things aren't always perfect. So I like that. I liked... I like when you don't have to go into a movie and expect, well, at the end, it might be happy because there have been enough movies where things go wrong that now I just don't know. It's either going to be a happy ending or it's going to be bittersweet and tragic and you never know what it's going to be. Yeah. So that makes it exciting, at least. All right. Do you have any other character notes? I'm done with mine other than I have notes on Mama and some of the just creepy moments and like shots and visuals and stuff from the movie. <laughs> but um, I had a note about because I was w- wondered at first the amount of time they had spent in the institute was like eighty seven days, so they were there in Dreyfus's little asylum institute. He called it an institute. I wondered if it was more like mm-hmm. an asylum. Um, For 87 days. So that's three months that they were there. And they had come a long way from being the two animalistic children that were on top of a refrigerator. Yeah. That were found by Bernie and the Bloodhound, which I don't know how much longer the search could have gone on because um, Lucas had run out of money. Yeah. I'm surprised it took them that long. It took them five years to find that car. (laughs) How do, I don't understand that because to me at first I thought, oh, this must be like the spring after. And so, you know, it's only been maybe six months. No, it's been five years. So that was a surprise because I, I had seen this movie in theaters, but there was a lot I had forgotten about it. So yeah. in many ways, it was like I wa- was watching it again for the first time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um... Yeah, I thought the pair of, of people that were looking for the kids were were interesting. They they made me laugh a little bit with they were drinking and they had had a bloodhound and yeah, it was just kind of an odd pairing of people. Um I did not like Jessica Chastain's wig. I thought that wig was a little <laughs> bit too much or too I don't know. It took away from things a little bit. So, I, yeah, I didn't care for that. I think that's all I have left for notes because I feel like we've covered everything else. Oh, there was one other moment when Lily was playing with the blanket with Mama and in the room. And then we get Victoria walking down a hallway. So, you know, uh-huh. it's not Victoria that was playing with Lily. But Victoria's almost distracting Annabelle while Lily is playing with Mama to Mm -hmm. keep Mama from interfere, you know, getting upset with Annabelle. Yep. Like trying to keep them apart. And I appreciated that. I loved that scene, that shot. That is like a reveal. (laughs) Because, yeah, you think, because you see Victoria pull the blanket off of Lily. And it's after we see the moth, which the moth 
is like they they come with mama so the moths are there mama's there and you know so the so it's kind of a little hint that you find out oh so mama's there to play but you know it's victoria that pulls the blanket off and then it cuts to you seeing her like fighting with the blanket so yeah you you make that assumption oh so victoria's pulling on the other end and then when victoria walks into the hallway you're like oh shit um and it's just like yeah. those fun little things. You just see like Lily's like legs yeah. dangling as she's like being lifted across the room. And you're like, Ooh, yeah. you see a little like shadow of mama on the wall for like a second. And it, oh, so many great, like little creepy visuals and things. Little moments. Yeah. There were a lot of cool visuals. There was a little bit more CGI than I would have liked. Yeah. But I mean, we've talked so many times about how, you know, practical effects are better. Yeah. When you can do it. So. Yeah. I mean, for this reason, that CGI doesn't always hold up. I mean, you get the Jurassic Park for some reason, even the CGI that was used in that movie manages to hold up pretty well all these years later. But it's not always the case when you don't have Steven Spielberg directing your movie. Um, Exactly. Where I mean, I remember, <laughs> you know, as far as I remember, like seeing this movie in theaters, it being incredible visually. And yeah. then watching it again. It's being only like, been eight years. Oh, you know, it does not yeah. hold up as much now. Uh, some of the scenes with full mama action don't look that great. Yeah, no. Yeah, I think some of the moments that creep me out the most that I was talking about were just, you know, really GB my heebies. Uh, <laughs> is when they, well, you know, you know, let you hear it, not see it. Where they don't show you, let you picture it yourself and so a lot of the sounds and stuff the humming is is one of the ones that is very creepy with the girls humming along and then annabelle's listening and then you get the humming of like the woman's voice with that and it's unsettling and then you know moments of like just the sounds that mama makes this like moaning bellowing sound that is horrifying just chilling and i'm like nope i don't I don't like it. <laughs> no, I'm good. Bye. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then like the little like portal things, which again, CGI for the most part, really, but they're not too bad. No. But, uh, which then I have to wonder, you know, her uh, possessing the body of Jean is really creepy. Again, CGI on the face. Eh. Yes. But, but like, it's, yeah. it's a creepy, creepy, her going down, sinking down through the floor and then coming back up through the next floor. Things like that are very creative and very creepy. Um, I had the question, like, so how did she get to the cabin with the girls? They don't talk about it. I'm assuming she just pulled the girls through the, the moth portal with her. That's Well, you know, that a moth portal, it does work really well, especially for possessed entities that are um, hell-bent on completing a ritual where they're going to drag children off a cliff yeah. to be with them forever. <laughs> Cause I feel like so, that makes the yeah. most sense is what she did. Cause I'm like, you know, some ghost from the 1800s possessing some other lady's bodies, not going to be able to drive a car very well. So no, uh, that's not something that was going on at that time. <laughs> and there are no renegade horses or carriages outside for them to uh, commandeer. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I think that's other than the one scene I have one one this one of the really creepy moments that I love that they threw in just those little things that are just there for the horror and for you to be like, "Oh," is you know, Annabelle's up in the girl's room and she's startled by what she thinks is Lily playing under the blanket and she's like, "Oh, Lily, you scared me again." And then you hear this is while Victoria's making her whatever that was for breakfast. But then she's like, you know, yelling up to her. It's just like, you know, breakfast time. She's like, oh, okay. And she was like, you know, Lily's hungry down here. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> You're like, wait, what? Lily's downstairs. And that's when the yeah. thing stands up and like, you see mama go back in the closet. And and then Annabelle go into the closet and you're like, oh, this can't be good. She sees the portal thing. But then when Victoria comes back upstairs and kind of stops her from, from catching mama. But it's just that whole scene is creepy, intense. And I, I love it. <laughs> Well, there's two. There's this point where it's dark inside, and you get this quick glimpse of Mama mm-hmm. when Annabelle isn't looking in there, like when she's looking away. And it, it's just they give you glimpses that just it's just a creepy, creepy thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that 
is all of my notes. Oh my goodness. So we've <laughs> reached the end of the notes. Yeah. I can't remember, Pig, what comes next? Um, we rewatch the movie and come at it again from a different angle. No. Um. No. <laughs> <laughs> See, what comes next is you've got some fun production notes and extra spoilery behind the scenes things. There were not as many. Um, I guess there were, they did want to use more practical effects, but it didn't end up materializing. Um, being able to do so they couldn't do what they really wanted to do without the cgi Mm -hmm. um and then jessica chastain was the first and only choice for annabelle still wish they'd rethink the wig Mm -hmm. um isabel nalise was not given many lines which i talked about already because she couldn't speak english um this is not the first ghoulish woman role for javier botet who also played Patient Zero in twenty in two thousand seven's Wreck, which is a great uh, movie with subtitles that everyone should check out. It was made into a U.S. version called Quarantine here, but the original, of course, is great. I think we could cover it on this podcast sometime. He also appeared as the leper, which is a form of a demon, in the movie It. So he has worked Mm -hmm. with Machete before. Mm -hmm. Mama's look was inspired by an Amedio Medigliani painting that Andy Machete owned. And Machete used this visual again in 2017's It, Chapter 2, as the painting that came to life to scare Stan. It took four hours every day. For Botet to get into his mama makeup, it took two hours to remove it. Jessica Chastain's character plays the bass, so she took some guitar lessons so that she would understand um, some of it. I mean, we saw so little of her actually playing the guitar, so Mm -hmm. I I don't know if... I can't say whether or not it was really effective. Um. For the week of the box office, for the week January 18th through the 24th, Jessica Chastain was in the top two movies on that chart that week because Mama debuted at number one and Zero Dark Thirty was number two. Nice. It's cool. There have been rumblings of a sequel since 2013. Universal announced in 2016 that Dennis Widmeyer and Kevin Kolsch would rewrite and direct the sequel, but without Jessica Chastain returning, I don't want to see this movie because I can tell mm. it's going to... Just not be good. There's been no progress as of 2021. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Don't do it. Without testing, don't, we don't need it. No. Because then again, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not even, not even Machete on his director. Like just. Yeah, no. It's not worth it. And then you don't have this in here and it's just like a tiny little thing. But speaking of it, chapter two with Machete, I mean, that's Jessica Chastain as well, returning for a role in that. it is. Oh my he gosh! His people. I he like, about that. I, there's a lot of directors that have their people they like to work with because you know he has the same. Yes. Uh, what would you call? Because it's kind of the same thing as like with Doug Jones or whatever. They're kind of these creature actors. Um, the creature do, actors. You know the. Yeah, you know, we talked about you know Botet being part of it, but yeah, because Ch- Chastain was in it chapter two as the older yeah. Bev. So. Yeah, and directors like to work with the same people that they're comfortable with, the ones that are going to bring the performance that they're looking for. And when they Mm -hmm. trust someone, they're going to use them again and again to make it happen. And when you have someone like Botet, who has proven himself, because he was also, I think, in Insidious Chapter 2, or one, I'm not sure, one or the other. So I feel like, you know, he thought that he would use the same creature artist, someone he could count on to bring the performance to life. But that is about, that's all I have for production notes. There were, was not a lot of information about this. There was a lot, when I was doing some research earlier, there were a lot of discussions about the CGI in this movie. A lot of people didn't like it. Some people did. So it was like kind of all over the place um, with regard to you know, what people were thinking. So in the end, I think the CGI was okay. 
it didn't hold up as well as I wish it would have, but I'm okay with it mm-hmm. because the story itself was really good. And I think Machete did a real, did a great job with bringing the story to life. And like I said, I'm going to go and see if I can find his short film because I want to see the differences. I wish I'd had time to watch it before we talked about it, but maybe sometime at the end of another podcast, I'll talk about it. Yeah. And then just to end, because uh, IMDb is my friend, just Javier Botet to see what kind of some of the other stuff he has done. Um, so yeah, I found some other ones that are interesting. There's a new movie on Netflix that keeps being added. Like, um, you is know, it screaming throw, at you? thrown at my face and I haven't watched it. But it's called His House. Apparently he does yep. a witch in that. And then, aside from it, but he also did some major white work for Game of Thrones. Um... <laughs> Ooh. He was Slenderman in the 2018 Slenderman, which I have not seen. He that did. Was, that was a movie pick. That was a movie. <laughs> and then, yeah, you mentioned Insidious. It was, it was the uh, the last key, the the latest Insidious movie. He was uh, key face there. Okay. Um, other stuff that he's done that's fun. Let's see, because I saw a couple other ones. He's done some work on The Conjuring, Conjuring 2. Uh, and a lot of Strigoi work for The Strain, since you mentioned that also. Ooh, <laughs> I love The Strain. If we were covering a se- you know, it's, I know it's been out a while. I need to find a podcast that covers it, because I do an <laughs> annual rewatch of that series. And I think it would help me prolong the rewatch if I had a podcast to listen to to go with it. And I... I want to, because I really love that series. It didn't end, I mean, it ended okay, but I think, like, seasons one and two were just really, really good, and I like to do an annual rewatch. Plus, it's creepy, you know? Yeah. I never so, finished it. I really enjoy it. I need to go back and finish the series, you should. rewatch it. You should. I feel like if we were going to podcast on a series, it would have been a great one to do. Mm-hmm. But we covered the movies, not the series. Except well, for Camp Cretaceous. We can do whatever we want. We might Camp come back and, and play with some stuff like that. So who knows? Well, we could. We can do whatever we want. It's our podcast. Mm-hmm. Let us know, guys, if there's something that you think we should, you know, have a one-off special episode about or something you'd like to hear from us on. Something that um, you think could bring some attention to a project or a show or movie that it doesn't get enough attention, let us know. We're always looking for cool things Mm -hmm. to do. All right. So uh, back on Mama. (coughs) Almost as if I led myself. man. Almost as if I led myself into a transition and hit a button. (coughs) The feedback phone is ringing. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) It is and find out what people thought about mama all right i'll grab it all right we've got a little bit of feedback this week the first one through a series of wonderful tweets on twitter comes from our friend tony tony had a lot to say about this movie and that is awesome I always love when people really dig in something and feel like they have a lot to say about it yeah always appreciate it so here she goes uh she says great ghost story i have a problem with movies like this or netflix's bly manor that they are labeled horror, but they aren't scary. Sure, there's some jump scares, but the story is so much more. I think more people would watch these movies if they could promote the story and not the scare. Bly Manor was a mystery slash love story. Uh, Mama is more about a mother's love to protect her children and feelings of jealousy when a new woman enters their lives. Also, step parents and how you can love someone else's children. I have no idea how you could label that, but do you get my point? Also, I love Guillermo del Toro. Pan's Labyrinth and The Orphanage are both haunting movies, but not horror movies. I love almost all of his projects, and I'm looking forward to Nightmare Alley. I found Mama and got the chance to watch it, and I thought this ghost lady was the girl's murdered mother, but it was some crazy lady who stole a baby. The ending was sad. Aww. Agreed. Very sad. But yeah, I like what she had to say. It's kind of more of a twist on a love story, or there's more of an emotional aspect, and then the horror is there as kind of a backdrop. Yeah, Bly Manor was great, which, <laughs> self-plug, <laughs> if you want to go back into the Strange Indeed uh, archives, me and Rima did cover all of The Haunting of Bly Manor over on Strange Indeed, and that was quite a journey. It, it was. A lot was. Of fun. Okay, so the next one we have is from Harrison. He says, love the shout out, Daphne, and no, 
the Gamera reboot movies from the 90s are definitely not the ones that were hilariously eviscerated by MST3K. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. That's what I figured. I was like, I, I doubt he's a... Because if you listen to, I think, last week's, we talked about that a little bit. When, or no, it was the, yeah, the look back special. So yeah, last week, or look ahead yeah. special. You know, last week, we talking about the Gamera stuff. I was like, can't be the ones that Mystery Science Theater <laughs> were having a ball yeah, with. No. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for reaching out again, yeah. Harrison. Always good to hear from people. And we do have one voicemail this week. Comes from our good friend, Eric. Let's hear what he has to say. So I just finished watching Mama, and... I think that was the first time I've seen it since it originally came out back in like 2013 or 2014 or something. Um, I remember liking it at the time and I, and I still really, really liked it on, on the second viewing. Uh, I think this was the first movie where I, uh, noticed Jessica Chastain and I really liked, uh, her performance in this movie and and decided, you know, she was going to be, uh, an actress I would keep my eye on, uh, for future works. Um, I also didn't realize that this was the uh, first film from Andy Muschietti who, who, that I had seen. And obviously he would go on to do uh, a great job with it and uh, also brought back Javier Botet, who I think did a great job, uh, really haunting job as as Mama in this film. Uh, and also as the um, painting lady and the, uh, uh, the leper in uh, the – it films. Um, also, what, what really sticks out um, to me in this movie is is the ending. Um, I, I really like that they did something different with, with the story because you know you really expect uh, once the um, infant's remains are, are handed over that uh, uh, you know Mama's going to move on to the other world, and then when uh, uh, Lily cries out, and then you know the rest of that that craziness ensues. Um, I thought that that was, you know, really, really original. And uh, I like the way that they handled that. Uh, also, it was super creepy when uh, Mama, uh, like, possesses Jean. That was wicked stuff. Uh, so overall, really, really like the movie. Can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about it. Bye. Thanks, awesome. Eric. Thank you so much, Eric. Great. Really appreciate <laughs> it. Makes me feel good about when we kind of choose movies, because I think this was one was, like, one of my ideas, we talked about it earlier while covering movies, you know, it's been a movie that I've always kind of considered in my top five horror movies for whatever, you know, one reason or another. And so I kind of brought it to the table. And so it makes me feel good when like other people are digging it and it's like, all right, cool. Yeah. Got some fun stuff to talk it's about. It's fun to share the love of film. That's <laughs> mm-hmm. why we do what we do here. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to submit your feedback, like Harrison, Tony, or Eric... You can do so by going to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash run for your lives podcast. You can email us at run for your lives podcast at gmail.com. Tweet at us at RFYL podcast on Twitter. Reach out to us on Instagram at run for your lives podcast. And if you're enjoying the show, tell your friends. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pretty much all the other podcast players, including YouTube, go to runfearlivespodcast.com for all the links you'll ever need and give us a review on Apple Podcasts as that's the best way to share the love and get us out there even more. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Speaking of sharing love, I'll go ahead and give some shout outs to podcasts that we are connected to and within our realm in the podcast universe around us. What's going on there? My other podcast, Strange Indeed, we are still running real busy. But having a lot of fun with it. <laughs> Double duty, covering Lock and Key Season 2 and Dexter New Blood over there. Both of those shows have been getting just increasingly so amazing in these seasons. So and we're having a blast covering both of those shows. They are so good. Yeah. So definitely, if you're a fan of Lock and Key or Dexter, check out Strange Indeed. We've been having a blast covering those. And then uh, House Podcastica, check them out as Wendy, Ben, and Greg are covering Wheel of Time, which also has been really good, and their coverage has been really good as well. Definitely want to give them some love, because that's been a lot of fun for me just as a listener. And then Panels to Pixels covering Hawkeye, as that's on Disney+. Plus. So I'm absolutely loving Hawkeye as well. 
Episode three might be one of the greatest episodes of TV I've seen in a long time. Really? That sets the bar very high. Yeah, it was so good. Now, episode four is out now. Uh, And four was really cool with some really fun stuff in it. But man, I still think like three makes the whole thing like, (laughs) like, I'm excited to see where they go without spoiling anything. Is this another like six episode? Yeah, I think it's only six and that's it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So they're already kind of wrapping it up, and there's some big things for the MCU coming in these last two, a few episodes, I'm pretty sure. That's all awesome. I can say. <laughs> and then, of course, our friend Derek and his co-hosts over on TV Podcast Industries are covering both of what I just mentioned before this. They're covering Wheel of Time and Hawkeye over there. So lots of good places to listen to lots of good show coverage. Then Walking Deadcast is wrapped for now. Uh They'll start doing some kind of bi-weekly little fun episodes while the shows are, you know, between seasons and off the air for a little bit. But they did just wrap up their coverage of World Beyond and then this first mid-season of Fear. There's some big Fear news that came out. You can go check them out for them to, <laughs> to talk about that if you're interested. I don't know if it changes much for me, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I've been thinking about <laughs> it and yeah, I think I'm still scarred. Yeah. <laughs> And then on the Watched It in the 80s podcast, for you 80s fans, Damien and Kelly are talking She's Having a Baby over there. So if you are a fan of that. movie. I remember it. (laughs) Yeah. Let me check that out. And then finally, Wilhelm. Great podcast to go check out. And around this Christmas time, there's been some fun special episodes coming out. And this week, Ben and Alex are talking their favorite movie Santas. Yeah, I'm interested in this one. I, yeah. I want to know where they went with it. Yeah. I, I mean, Tim Allen has to make the list, right? You would think right? so. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but I'm not sure. I mean, it's Ben and Alex, and so I'm just not sure yeah. where they're going to go with it. Mm-hmm. Does Krampus count? <gasps> <gasps> yes. <laughs> well, in the Run for Your Lives universe, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely does. Nice. <laughs> Speaking of things coming out on podcasts, Daphne, what is happening next week right here on Run for Your Lives? Okay, so next week, we are venturing into a unique adventure that features a bright but misunderstood 11-year-old boy who has the ability to talk to the dead and is faced with saving his town from zombies and a vengeful witch. We are going to be talking about the Leica Studios animated feature Paranorman. Yay! <laughs> this is one that's very near and dear to Peg's heart. Yes, it was. We, we jumped to it pretty quickly because if you listen to that look ahead episode, this was on my list, and we decided to go ahead and jump into it because yeah, I I love this movie. I love Leica. <laughs> I love. So it, it was a treat to get to do this one. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. I've never, I had never seen it, so this was my first step into the like a world so you'll have to wait until next week to hear what i thought about it because you already know peg's gonna give it two thumbs up (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) and with that we've come to the end of another fun episode thanks everyone for listening i'm daphne and i'm peg and if you have to run you better run for your lives Bye bye